അറ്റൻഷൻ ശ്രീ രാഹുൽ ഗാന്ധി മൈ ഡിയർ രാഹുൽ ആസ് എ സീനിയർ സിറ്റിസൺ ആസ് സമൺ ഹു ഹാസ് സെർവ് ദ കൺട്രി ഇൻ ദ ഫീൽഡ് ഓഫ് എജ്യൂക്കേഷൻ ടു ദ ബെസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ഹിസ് എബിലിറ്റി ആസ് സമൺ ഹു ഹാസ് ഹാഡ് സംതിങ് വെരി ബേസിക് ആൻഡ് ഡിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് ടു ഡു വിസ് യു ദ ഡിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് പാസ്റ്റ് ഐ മേക്ക് ബോൾഡ് to give you a few advice if you have time please see this video you are a good reader you are a good viewer you are a good thinker like your mother you are open to constructive ideas you value feedback from the people that's the reason why you did the bharat jodo yatra and the nyaya yatra consider this as a response to your yatras something that uh, dispassionate third party person who has no political allegiance or obligations of any kind to any party including yours has to say to you out of goodwill and goodwill in particular towards the people of india i'm sure they deserve a better deal and that's my central concern and whatever i say whatever i include this in, in in this video is guided by this overarching concern that the people of india deserve better so let's get started um for what i can see the india alliance will uh remain in the opposition for the next 5 years and in a previous video i said that that's exactly what i prefer to see because the alliance that uh, you lead or mr karge leads and uh, of which you are the most active member is simply not in a position to burden uh, shoulder the burdens of responsibility you need to, you need to become a farmer who has if uh unit uh to kindle hope and sustain hope in the people and the coming five years that should be our aim priority and mission that uh, the humble beginnings made by inaugurating the india alliance is consolidated and taken to the business and bosom of the people of india as an option they can repose their trust in as an option that can sustain and validate their hopes and aspirations and i'm making a i'm going to make a few suggestions to that effect here are they i think in the 5 years lying ahead of you as an important element in the now resuscitated thank god opposition a uh, force in this country there are three things i would expect to happen first of all uh, or what i consider to be the three main ingredients of the opposition dharma the first is to resist resist with might and main with dogged determination every anti people policy move or maneuver uh overt or covert very often anti people policies are not presented in their naked truth but uh to borrow a few words from shakespeare uh by indirection therefore uh you have to remain alert to the duty to resist whatever is likely to undermine the welfare of the people and the health and wholeness of the, the the society of people that india is we the people of india so the first duty is to resist the second duty is to raise hopes and um, uh, let me use a clumsily formulated uh, title for my thought the other side of the issue principle the other side of the issue 
Now, every party in, or every coalition in governance will have their own agendas. And it happens universally that parties uh, acquire power by making all kinds of pro-people gestures to the people. But once they are ensconced in seats of power, they forget the people, then they run after their own agendas. And all the while, they'll, they have to keep up the illusion that they are leading the people to the very heaven itself. So, uh, this is the role that propaganda plays. And propaganda is the art of telling lies like truth. So, in this context, the opposition parties have a tremendous role to play in enabling the people to see the other side of the picture, the other side of the situation, which is always kept hidden. For example, if you were to remember what happened through monetize, demonetization, the government very naturally and understandably trump, trumpeted or drummed up the idea that demonetization is a sure short solution to all the major problems of this country. But the opposition parties fail to educate the people or open their eyes to the hidden agendas in the demonetization uh, uh, mistake. You did whatever you could, but uh, I don't think it was efficiently enough organized. And uh, a far more co coordinated um, resistance to demonetization could have been and should have been mounted at that time. Unfortunately, it, when, because it was found wanting, it turned out to be a turning point, a watershed moment in the political ascendancy of BJP and from a disastrous economic measure that should have spelt doom for the BJP, it gained strength and a clearer indication of the ineffectiveness of the opposition parties in, in this country cannot be and need not be cited. So, an important function of all opposition parties is to stand with the people and enable them to see the other side of every situation, every policy that the government comes up with, always couched in deviousness, what is uh, far away from, what is tangential to the welfare and interests of the people will always be packaged. That's the ultimate solution to all the problems of the people and the greatest service that can be done to the people, especially to the poor. Uh, the paradox of politics is that all politicians thrive by the poor, but they do precious little for the poor because, and this is the most important thing, for politicians to continue their um, um, self-seeking practice of politics, it is necessary that the poor are kept poor and ideally, the poor must be made poorer, as has happened in India in the last 10 years. But neither of the opposition parties in this country really explain to the people the logic behind it. Yes, you and several others said that you know, the poor are becoming poorer, so on and so forth, but it's just a stereotypical statement. But the important thing to do is to explain to the people, to educate the people as to the logic that underlies this anti-people drift in the life of a nation which is deliberately imparted. It's not an accident. It's a principle of policy. So that's the second part. The third part, which I consider to be extremely important, that's the weakest link in the entire chain of the responsibilities of the opposition parties as far as India is concerned, is prepare the people for a change. Prepare the people for a change. Or, to borrow the words of the Mahatma, Prepare the people to be the change that they want to see around them. Be the change that you want to see around you. And prepare the people for that. Unfortunately, the terrible mistake that is perpetuated in this country by all opposition parties is to assume that all they have to do is to checkmate the policies and the moves made by the party in power. In the, in the process, the people are left f forgotten, they're left far behind. They're never enabled to be art active participants in this process of nation building. 
It is in this respect that maximum change needs to be brought about. And I bring this to your notice because I believe you're the right person to do this. And if this is not done, I'm afraid there's very little to look forward to it, uh, forward to in the future. Ultimately, my dear Rahul, democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. And therefore, in democracy, the people, not the parties, not some, you know, larger than life political characters, the people must be change agents. The responsibility or the duty of opposition leaders, opposition parties, think tanks, so on and so forth, is to educate and equip people to be the change agents, to be the change, to internalize the change that they want to see around them. This task is not even begun. And uh, in order to do this, there are a few things that I suggest. And the suggestions that, are, that I'm now going to make all pertain to the third point I made, namely, the urgent and the all-important task of educating and equipping the people of India to be the opposition, the people of India to be the change that they want to see. Here are a few very practical, simple suggestions. First of all, educate the people to judge political leaders, particularly those in governance, not in terms of what they say, not in terms of what they showcase, not in terms of the event management at which they are so good. The people must be educated to judge their rulers in terms of what they do. Unfortunately, all this uh, political rigmarole, all this big do, this show, this pomp and splendor, this event management, befuddling, mind-boggling, uh, brain-paralyzing as far as the common man is concerned, all this is mounted and all this is thrust upon the people, ably and terribly aided and abetted by the unconscionable media in this country, just to confuse the common man so that he does not judge rulers by what they do. Rather, they value them in terms of what they say. For example, Modi is supreme in his ability to coin slogans. And slogans have become a substitute for people's welfare. Uh, right-wing political parties, right-wing economic uh, blocks all over the world are exceptionally good at event management. This is the theme I have dealt with. I don't believe in repeating myself. And you're also acutely aware of this, therefore I leave it to you. So let the people now begin to judge their rulers, not by what they showcase, not by what they say, but by what, what they actually do. And in order to enable them to do that, a great attempt nationwide has to be made to raise awareness of the people concerning their day-to-day -day realities that, that nick them, that needle them, that sting them. But what's happening in India? From one end of the country to the other, of late people have been saying, look, our plight is miserable. We are desperate. There is no, not enough food to eat. There is no job. There is no income. There is no economic security. But we will vote for the same person. I am not bothered about X or Y ruling India for 10 years, 100 years. That's not my issue. What I'm saying is that this is a process by which the power of the people, therefore the heart of democracy, is kept paralyzed. And that is something that's unacceptable to me. And to a large extent, I would consider this to be a proof of the ineffective role of the opposition parties in this country. Therefore, simple thing, shift the focus of the people's attention from mere words, very catchy phrases, expressions, and uh, to what the government actually does and policies, priorities, they need to be explained in, 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 a, in a way that the common man can understand and uh, so that they can take informed decisions. Until and unless the common man in this country is educated and equipped to take informed decisions, 
which would then influence the quality of his voting uh, culture, there will be no hope for this country. You know, Arthur Kostler, one of my favorite authors, said this about Hitler's ascendancy to power. Now, I'm quoting from memory. If a few words here and there are not exactly what uh, Arthur Kostler wrote, please forgive me. I'm sure you recognize uh, the text and all that. He said, Hitler used perfectly legitimate democratic means to murder democracy. I don't want to explain that. That sentence is uh, clear enough. And that's a concern I have at the back of my mind in saying that we need to educate the people to make responsible choices and sensible decisions so that they also are able to exercise their right to franchise in a life-affirming, nation-building fashion. Now, therefore, there is a need to enable citizens of India to remain vigilant and well-informed. The opposition parties in this country, and now the, the, the India coalition, must understand that it's their sacred duty to keep the citizen of India well aware and well educated. And that's a task that cannot wait. It has to begin here and now. Finally, <clears throat> and I'll take a little while to explain this because I consider extreme importance what I'm going to say, and you will, be, uh, you, will, you, will, you will readily understand why I consider this to be of crucial importance. The third and the last point. The opposition parties, it's actually building upon the first, second point I made, that is equipping uh, the citizens of India, the voters of India. The opposition parties have to provide to the citizens of India the tools of political thought that they need to understand the realities around them. Now, when I say this, people will ridicule me, thinking that, you know, you think that the whole of India is in Stephen's College. No, I think we must stop being cynical about the intelligence of the common man. After all, one of the significant features of the 2024 general election outcomes is that the voter in India has proved himself to be far more intelligent, discerning and wise than we ever gave him credit or her credit for. And that's what emboldens me to say this. The, the common man in this country can think. What he lacks is the tools of thought that he needs because education, the practice of education in this country has been conducted at a maximum distance from lived realities. It's a pedagogic issue about which I've said and written a lot. Uh, I, I will not include all of that in this very small video. Uh, I hope uh, if and when you get the chat opportunity to guide the destiny of India, you would pay the kind of attention that education really deserves and urgently needs. That's, another, that's for another day. Now, as regards the immediate task of providing to the common man tools of thought with which he can analyze for himself the realities all around him and the realities that impinge on his life from day to day, uh, let me give you a, a particular illustration. Because nothing like an illustration to make the idea uh, transparent, simple, uh, and uh, easily understood. Now, in the last five years, I found a lot of bewilderment and confusion among the people. This may not be adequately reflected in the 2024 general election results, but it is reflected, though the election pundits are not making a reference to it for whatever reasons. Now, the reason for this widespread confusion that prevails among the people of India is that the Modi government has very successfully mixed up two different categories through two different modes of government. Very important to realize. Since this is not talked about, I'll take a little while over it. When you look at uh, the various modes of governance that history has seen so far, you can recognize three categories. 
three types. In the interest of brevity, let me list them as the government by superstition. Second, the government by power. Third, government by reason. Very easy to remember. Superstition, power, reason. Now, what about government by reason? Historians of governance identify governance by priests, priests as rulers, as governance by superstition. Religion, when it's dragged into the material day-to-day -day life of the people, particularly in organizing, managing, warehousing power, tends to shift its foundation from spirituality or true faith to superstitions. That is why, for example, even today in India, politicians are far more superstitious than most other people. Uh, for um, tarot card readers, for horoscope uh, writers, for fortune tellers, for practitioners of all kinds of occult art, art Election season is really uh, the gold mine because politicians consult them and politicians treat them like they are gods. Every word uttered by an astrologer or a tarot card reader or whatever practitioner of the occult will be like pronouncement made by the Almighty Himself. Uh, not only that, when you go back, back far, far enough in time when priests were also rulers, you will find that um, reality was a matter of whatever the priestly class decided. The people really had uh, no, no say in the matter. Uh, a good example of this actually is the history of the, of the Jews. For a long time they did not have king. Why? Because they had prophets or priests anointed by God as their king. And it's only at the time of Samuel the prophet that the people go to him with the demand that all others have kings, give us a king as well. And Samuel resists to the best of his abilities, but people are, people are adamant and that he has to give in to them. So that's a sequence I have in mind. You think of the style of governance before the emergence of monarchy in Israel. Who decided what? The people had absolutely no role to play. They were the passive objects on which the will of the ruler was imposed and the will of the ruler was legitimized, not in terms of good governance, but in terms of the will of God, which the ruler represented. So the divine and the human coalesced into one in this mode of Governance by superstition. Now, in this mode of governance by superstition, it is sacrilege. It's an insufferable offense to think realistically, think in terms of the lived realities of life, think for oneself, exercise one's understanding and discernment and take a stand. All this is unforgivable. And this will be immediately classified as treason and it will attract capital punishment. So governance by superstition is also characterized by extreme intolerance. Wherever there is intolerance, there is superstition. Wherever there is superstition, there is intolerance. Mark my words. It cannot be otherwise. So very easily understood, governance by superstition is governance by the priestly class. Even today, the priestly class in every religion uh, behave as though they are second class kings. Why second class kings? And that brings me to the second point, there is governance by power. From the time of the Middle Ages in Europe, you find the emergence of the secular ruler proper. I mean, not that there were not kings and emperors before that, after all, we think of uh, the great conquerors, empire builders, Alexander the Great, so on and so forth. I'm talking about the broad principles. Now, when the kings rose, gods fell. That's European history. When the king was ascendant, 
gods declined and faded out. Then what happened? The power of superstition and the power of raw secular power became one. So the priest and the king became one. And a good example of that is the theory of divine rights under which the English kings ruled. where The kings made the people believe that they were God's deputies anointed to rule on behalf of God and therefore it was impious and irreligious on their part to rebel against their king no matter how inefficient, how anarchic and how harmful to the welfare of the people he or she, if it's a queen, turned out to be. The people had to meekly endure the misgovernance of a stupid king because an inefficient or wicked king was God's punishment of, on the people. And people have no business to resist God's chastisement. See how theories are made to defend and perpetuate the indefensible. So this is the second mode. First was governance by superstition. Second is governance by power. Now, this will give you a perspective. And if the people of India can understand it, they will acquire a perspective to understand why the new parliament complex was inaugurated in the manner that was. There, it was not a Shankaracharya. It was a secular ruler, Sri Narendra Modi, who was the chief priest, the high priest. There were several priests, but they were made to stand in awe of him, playing not even second fiddle, but some distant third fiddle to him. There was only one almighty force and that was Narendra Modi. It is not an accident, it's deliberately done. It's part of a strategy to din it into the consciousness of the people that the two modes of power have now become one and they're completely concentrated in this one figure who is of mythological stature and intensity. So, the Vista complex was in a way the inauguration of the highest point in Modi's political apotheosis. Modi's self-revelation as a god on earth, which was then articulated frontally thereafter. Now, let's come to the third mode of governance, governance by reason. Well, before I go into that, so the governance of the Vista complex was then completed, complemented and completed by the inauguration of the Ram temple in Ayodhya, where the prime minister was the high priest. Now, see how beautifully things are all cobbled together. I haven't read a single article in any of the newspapers or magazines in this country, which really tells the people what is what. The not so hidden pattern, strategy, thinking, symbolism, and the nuances surrounding all of this. It's so fascinating to unpack and decode all of this. But it was not done. Maybe. It could not have been done. Who knows? Now come to the third, the third part, which is governance by reason. Now that is where democracy comes into, into the picture. Governance by reason has certain very clear ingredients. One is uh, uncompromising respect for the rights of the people. Rights of the people. Second is firm commitment to universal values and ideals, particularly the four fundamental values embedded in the preamble to the constitution, namely justice, liberty, equality, fraternity. Without that, there can be no democracy, whether it is in India or any other part of the world. Please don't think that the preamble to the constitution is only a beautifully designed page. That's the heart of the constitution. That's where democracy's heart beats. And whether or not that is being upheld is a question that the opposition parties have to continually address and drum up people's awareness about. Unfortunately, this was not being done adequately, though I know that 
a lot of attempts were made. In fact, much more than political parties, citizens, civil society groups took up this issue and organized a large series of meetings to raise awareness about the uh, erosion of the four foundational or shaping ideals of the democratic uh, constitution of India. Uh, the third aspect of liberal democracy or secular socialist democracy, if you like, is the, uh, the validation of reason, the validation of reason as the instrument for managing realities. As against superstition, as against raw power, in the case of superstition, it's God who decides. In the case of power, it's the king who de decides or the counterparts of the old king who now uh, has secular offices but behaves exactly like the old dictators and potentates. So, God decides, man decides. Now, in the third mode democracy, it's neither God nor man that, decide, that decides. It is reason. And where does reason dwell? Not in the parliament alone. Not in the uh, political leader, uh, leaders alone, not in the ruling elite alone. Reason is spread, reason must be spread throughout the body politic. Reason that confines itself to certain pockets in a country is anything but reason. Because, as Immanuel Kant very beautifully put it, it is in the nature of reason to be universal. What is not universal cannot be reasonable or rational. What is parochial cannot be rational. That's why in religion there is no scope for reason. Rationality is impossible in the narrow domain of reason because there is parochialism that prevails. But it's quite possible for certain vested interests to infiltrate the sacred uh, space of democracy with a parochial mind or as we now say, the perivar mind, I am not talking about the ideology, but the metaphor, the perivar mind or the dynastic mind, if you like, and govern only for the interest of a very small group of people. That is how it comes about that the greatest achievement of India in the last 10 years is that we have produced the maximum number of billionaires in this country and a billion and more people are languishing. Now, is that rational? Is that reasonable? No, not at all. Then how come we are a democracy? That question nobody will ask because nobody has taught the people that reason is the heart of democracy. It's high time that the opposition parties in this country now went back to the people to be in solidarity with them, to be their seeing eyes, listening ears and articulating minds and mouths so that the reality in this country can both be understood aright and impacted, impacted. So, there is a huge, huge agenda to be undertaken. Unfortunately, what has happened in this country and why this kind of agenda has not taken off the ground is that mostly in this country, political parties wanted to gain power by default. That is, a, a, a party or a coalition of parties will be voted to power, they will misuse the power, then they will incur the wrath of the people and the citizens will punish them with their votes and they will be kicked out of the seat of power. Then the other group or the other party that is waiting in the wings can then move in and perpetuate the same nonsense and therefore you have uh, the interesting phenomenon in our country of the party with the difference Justifying all that it does when questions are asked, saying you also did the same thing. If the party with the, with the difference is to do exactly uh, uh, like uh, exactly what other parties have done in the past, for God's sake, tell me with a little bit of reasonableness, how is your party different from any other party? Now, unfortunately, the common man, the citizen in this country has not been educated, trained, challenged, made aware to ask such questions. Culture of governance will change in this country only when the common man is empowered to ask questions. 
and everything is being done everything's done so far in this country has been done actually with the unstated but very clear intention of disabling the common man from asking questions let's take one example and i close on that parliamentary proceedings are telecast throughout the country what happens in the parliament is carried into even the remotest village why can't the process be also reversed why can't the lived realities of the people in our far flung villages in the tribal areas in urban slums wherever life is languishing be carried straight into the temple of our democracy the parliament why this one way traffic you think this is democratic now all of these must be challenges for the opposition to uh, recognize to address and uh, I'll, I'll conclude my thinking here i'm sure you'll pay due heed to the small small points i've made here and that you can uh, become a change agent as far as india is concerned and that's the need of the r and i'm sure that given the sterling sincerity of purpose that you have you will do all you can to be the change agent of india because hope rests on change thank you